Hello, welcome to another episode of Watchtower Examination. My name is Winston. Procrastination is not a good thing. I saw a comment on a recent video, someone saying that she can't wait to see what video 666 will be about. It was my intention to respond to her to let her know that the videos are just numbered in terms of sequence and I have nothing special planned for 666. I just do these videos as I see an importance to discuss something. And as I've been looking on the shepherd of the Shepherding the Flock book, looking on the reasons in that book for which a judicial committee should be formed, I've been led to wonder a few things. It is rather interesting that there was a time I wondered if Jehovah's Witnesses, I wondered what the response of Jehovah's Witnesses would be to the story of the woman caught in adultery, only to find that they probably do not even discuss it because it does not appear in their Bible. Not just their Bible, but a number of modern day versions of the scriptures influenced by Westcott and Hort. So, they, so that story is not there. Because I am wondering about this matter of striking a balance, if the watchtower understands that when it comes down to the matter of discipline. There is another story in the Bible that I wonder if the organization understands. Jesus told a parable. The King James Version speaks about the parable of the wheat and the tares. Other translation speaks about the wheat and the weeds. Let us look at that account from the New International Version. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The moral of that story as taught in Christian churches is that the church is a combination of genuine Christians and hypocrites. But you've got to be careful who you try to weed out the hypocrites because you are not the best judge of who is sincere and who is not. And so it is dangerous. You run the risk of pulling out genuine Christians. The moral of the story is that you've got to be careful how you are pulling people and expelling people from the church, but to let them grow together. And when the Lord comes, who is the righteous judge, he will determine who are the hypocrites and who are the genuine Christians. And I wonder, as I looked at the Shepherding of the Flock book and see some of the offenses for which witnesses will be disfellowshipped or run the risk of being disfellowshipped, I wonder, well, I was going to say, I wonder, but Raymond Franz answered it. I was about to say, I wonder if they do not spend a lot of time looking at disciplinary action. Raymond Franz, Franz said it, that the governing body has presided over so many meetings about what are the kind of offenses for which people should be disfellowshipped. 
and that well I don't recall if it is friends who said this but others have said it that a lot of these cases have to do with sexual immorality it was rather interesting I wondered before doing this video what does the what is a watchtower's take on this parable and for the first time I saw the watchtower's take on the parable and I had to shake my head and say oh father here we go again during the time of the end the son of man would send forth his reapers the angels to separate the symbolic wheat from the weeds the sons of the kingdom would be gathered Matthew 13 24 to 30 and 36 to 43 how did this come about and what bearing does it have on Jehovah's having a people on earth the conclusion of the system of things began in 1914 during the war that broke out that year the few thousand anointed Christians the sons of the kingdom were in spiritual captivity to Babylon the Great in 1919 Jehovah delivered them making a clear distinction between them and the weeds or imitation Christians he gathered the sons of the kingdom into an organized people in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy will a land be brought to birth in one day or will a nation be born all at once yet as soon as Zion went into labor she gave birth to her sons Isaiah 66 8 Zion Jehovah's organization of spirit beings brought forth her spirit anointed sons and organized them into a nation all I can say is <laughs> oh boy where do they get these things from anyhow this is not what this video is about I'm not going to be this is one of those things that really feel that I should not dignify with a response but the time will come when they will not endure sounder doctrine but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables no I have in my Christian journey belonged to a few churches at least two churches I have worshipped in several churches during my lifetime. I've spent a lot of time watching TBN. I've listened to a lot of radio broadcast religious services. And I've never heard the phrase shepherding call. I remember when my marriage started falling apart. I was visited by an elder of my church who was concerned about what was going on. He was concerned for me and he came to encourage me. So I guess you would call that a shepherding call. But I've never heard that phrase except from the Watchtower organization. And this is an example of a shepherding call that I felt went too far. Hi, Gloria. Hi, Brother Williams. I think I'd get lost in this big apartment. Well, Jehovah blessed us for our hard work. Hmm. Really, it just means longer hours on the job and more work around the house. Hmm. You know, the other day in field service, we passed by your old house. I like that place. I remember our nice visits there. I do, too. That yeah. was a great place. Yeah. Well, Tina, do you want to show Brother Williams around while I finish the coffee? Oh, okay. Come on in. Brother Williams likes the old place. Seems like he likes here too. It all seems very nice. What do you think of this place, Tina? Well, honestly, I wish we never left the other place. Really? Why do you feel that way? Everything's so different here. Everything has to look good for you to fit in. You have to wear the nicest clothes. You have to drive the most expensive car. Everything's 
it's just, it's just different, that's all. Yeah, you know, I understand. I was about your age when we moved into a new neighborhood, and it can certainly be challenging. But you know what might help? If you set a new goal. Okay, like what? Well, what do you think? What interests you? Well, I was thinking of learning a new language. Really? That's an excellent goal. What do you think of Ricky learning sign language? Oh, I think it's really exciting. I do too. You know, he is really making the truth his own. And if he keeps on applying himself, Jehovah God is gonna really bless him. Yeah. I was hoping to see Anna. Is Anna here? Oh, she's with Kevin. Kevin? Kevin who? Kevin's one of our relatives. They work together at a pharmaceutical company. He's a pretty nice guy and from a nice family too. Mm. Tina, are you okay? Mm-hmm. How do you think Anna's doing? I have commented on this already and I will not spend much time on it except to say that is going a bit too far. This elder is too much in the people's lives and there is nothing in the scriptures that encourages elders so to do. Um, she's, she's going through different things right now. We invited her friend over from the other congregation to maybe encourage her. That's nice. So there you have this man in these people's living room going too far, certainly in my opinion. And the topic of part one of this two-part series is get out of their rooms. But I'm not talking about their living rooms. Here is a sample of some of the offenses for which witnesses can be disfellowshipped according to the Shepherding the Flock book. Consider an example in which judicial action would be warranted. A married brother spends an inordinate amount of time with his female secretary after work hours, but insists there is no romantic interest. His concerned wife informs the elders, who give him strong counsel. Later, he claims to be leaving overnight for a business trip. His suspicious wife and a relative follow him to the secretary's home. They observe the secretary invite him inside at 10 p.m. and continue watching all night until he leaves the home at 7 a.m. When the elders speak to him, he admits that he spent the night with his secretary, but he denies that he committed adultery. In such a case, the elders have a basis to take judicial action because there is strong circumstantial evidence of pornea, and there may be elements of brazen conduct. The innocent mate's conscience may allow her to divorce him and remarry. She should not be criticized if that is her decision. Did they say circumstantial evidence? Is there circumstantial evidence when a child accuses an adult of sexual abuse? Does the watchtower take the same circumstantial evidence attitude? Or do they pull on the two witness rule? In this case, two witnesses witnessed him going to the house witnessed him leaving, but they did not witness him committing adultery. If he is honest enough to admit that he spent the night there, but said that nothing happened, can he be given the benefit of a doubt? The, 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 the case sounds a little bizarre, you know, man, goes to his secretary's house and leaves at 7 a.m. <laughs> you would think that if this thing really happened. Anyhow, for what it's worth, but do you take action 
that is going to disrupt a marriage on circumstantial evidence and consider that to be justice when you do not take circumstantial evidence for child abuse? Why is this so? Let's move on. Gross uncleanness. Uncleanness with greediness. Scriptures given. Galatians 5, 19-21 lists many vices that are not classed as pornea, but that could lead to ones being disqualified from God's kingdom. Among them are uncleanness. When one practices uncleanness to a serious degree, it can be grounds for disfellowshipping from the Christian congregation. Elders should use good judgment in discerning whether the conduct is minor uncleanness that can be handled by counsel or gross uncleanness that requires the formation of a judicial committee. And the number of Watchtower articles are cited. The question is, where is the scriptural instruction for the formation of a judicial committee? Where? Which book? Which chapter? Which verse? Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Though this is not an exhaustive list, gross uncleanness may be involved in the following. One, momentary touching of intimate body parts or caressing of breasts. If such conduct occurred on a few isolated occasions, especially between two persons involved in a courtship with the intent to marry, counsel from two elders, two elders may suffice to handle such minor uncleanness. The elders should inform the coordinator of the body of elders of the situation. However, if the conduct occurred on numerous occasions and the actions escalated in gravity and frequency, it may constitute gross uncleanness with greediness requiring judicial action. Their wrongdoing may constitute brazen conduct if they give evidence of a disrespectful, insolent attitude toward God's laws. For example, the individuals may have no intentions of pursuing marriage. I did say that this is a somewhat sensitive subject and that I am not too excited about doing this because you run the risk of giving the impression as though you're saying to people, do not listen to the watchtower who's telling you, you know, to be, what's the word? To hold a constraint on your desires. It may be seen as me saying, go out there and just have your fun, which is what I do not ever want to be accused of doing. However, this is going too far. Would you care to remind me of the verse of Scripture or the verses or the passages of Scripture that say touching of body parts is a sin for two people who are contemplating marriage? Where does the watchtower get that? But the other thing I'm considering is how does that become the business of the watchtower? What these two consenting adults do in private if they have not openly... And this is the wrong impression could be given here. Because in part two, I'm going to be touching on the subject of premarital sex. So I do not want to get into that here. But let us, for the sake of argument, assume for now, just for the sake of argument, that going all the way is a sin. 
if they have not done that, but they engaged in petting, what is the sin of petting described in the scriptures? Where is the biblical counsel that elders or deacons or bishops or pastors or whoever in the Christian church should be so in people's private lives? Where? Two, immoral conversations over the telephone or the internet. A practice of engaging in immoral conversations over the telephone or the internet including sexting, can involve obscene speech or gross uncleanness, either of which can be a basis for judicial action. If such conduct occurred on a few isolated occasions, judicial action may not be necessary. Counsel from two elders, again, two elders, based on which scripture may be sufficient to handle such minor uncleanness. The elders should inform the coordinator of the body of elders of the situation. However, such conduct may escalate in gravity and by frequent repetition becomes gross uncleanness with greediness requiring judicial action, especially if the individual had been previously counseled. The elders must use good judgment in determining whether the wrongdoing has escalated to a point warranting judicial action. This is what you call a classic definition of a high control cult. I'm imagining myself a young man courting and my very conversations with my girlfriend is something that could land me in a judicial committee. How does my conversation with my girlfriend get to the attention of the elders? Private conversation. And I'm asking again, I suppose you will never find WhatsApp in the Bible, right? And you won't find telephone in the Bible, right? What is this um, I really can't fathom this one. Because if, if two persons are Christians, you expect them to be relatively decent in their conversations. So it wouldn't therefore be the use of expletives. <laughs> so if they are contemplating marriage, are they allowed to discuss sexual activity in, in terms of how far they will go or what? I'm, I'm just, I, I really can't put a finger on what the watchtower is saying here. So what if, what if two young people contemplating marriage decide, I, I don't even know what to ask. It just, uh, it just appears to me that these men are going too far in people's lives. I have never heard anything like this. And I am a Christian who belongs to a church. I'm trying to imagine hearing. <laughs> but in our church, we do it differently because when it comes on to matters that when, I, when someone is being recommended for expulsion, it is something that is taken to the church. And I cannot imagine the number of brows that would be raised, people looking at each other and wondering, what is this? If we're thinking about disfellowshipping someone for conversations, private conversations they had, especially two people contemplating marriage. <laughs> that's, that's, as far as I'm concerned, their damn business, not that of the Watchtower.
Let the wheat and the tares grow together until the day of harvest. In other words, leave some things be. Let God be the judge. Okay? Now, this one is interesting, discussing pornea. Point four, masturbation of oneself is not pornea. So, masturbation, according to the Watchtower, is not pornea. So, there will be no need for judicial action for that. But here comes a bit of contradiction now. Because we just read that you can be disfellowshipped for uncleanness. Check this out. Uncleanness. The original Bible word translated uncleanness is a broad term that includes much more than sexual sins. It can refer to the harmful practice of smoking or the telling of obscene jokes. It also applies to unclean activities practiced by an individual in private, such as reading sexually stimulating books or viewing pornography, which may lead to the unclean habit of masturbation. And Colossians 3.5 is cited. Would you like to hear it from the New World Translation? Deaden therefore your body members that are on the earth as respects sexual immorality, uncleanness, uncontrolled sexual passion, hurtful desire, and greediness, which is idolatry. So masturbation is not pornea, but it just may be associated, according to the Watchtower now, and their citing of scripture. Which is it? Sexual immorality, uncleanness, uncontrolled sexual passion, hurtful desire, greediness. Which one? How about you just stick with the scriptures? Jesus gave this circumstance under which someone must be or should be expelled. Matthew 18. Read it. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 5 a brother who was engaged in sexual immorality so public, so embarrassing that he said it was worse than what was going on in the world. And such open violation of God's law as of someone who is calling himself a brother with the church, as it were, just hugging it up was something that annoyed Paul. So, if you have someone who is openly violating God's law, openly embarrassing, bringing reproach on God's name, Paul encouraged you to disfellowship such a person. Look at the sins that are mentioned. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. Drunkard. Someone will be known in the community to be a drunkard. Extortion. A, a public open horrible crime so you see a common trend this open violation this open rejection of God's laws now I do not wish to suggest to you that private sin is not as serious as public sin but let us understand and be reminded I'm sorry that the story of let he who is without sin cast the first stone is not in the Watchtower's Bible. And our Jesus said, go and sin no more. I condemn you not. Every single Christian struggles with sin. The church is not a museum of saints. The church is a hospital for sinners. No one struggling with sin should be expelled. The Apostle Paul himself told us in the Word of God that he himself is struggling with sin. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, 
But what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Because it is our natural tendency toward that which is evil, we are said to be, according to the scriptures, born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So let the wheat and the tares grow together until the day of harvest and stop spending, stop investing so much time determining who must be expelled from the organization. This idea about keeping the organization clean, you may be taking that a little bit too far. Where do you strike the balance between letting, or oh, then again, allowing the wheat and the weeds to grow together? It is because you have this weird understanding of what the parable means. This organization is going too far. I say to you, well, who's going to listen to me? But it would be good if you would, as elders, would get out of people's bedrooms. Maybe you yourself should spend more time on your knees talking to your God than trying to police what people do in private. That is going too far. Now, in the next video, I'll be looking on a subject that is... I'm trying to find the word. But I'll be asking the question, do Christians have a higher standard of morality than God? Do join me for that one. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, remember to press that like button. I invite you to subscribe to the channel. I'm also inviting you to subscribe to my other channel, Things Jamaican, that will help to keep this channel going. The links are in the description below. Thanks again. Do come again. Have yourself a wonderful day. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.